You know, you guys have ended up being really lucky. I had planned to do this cheeky thing whereby I had this whole established trilogy of videos where we cover the three cancelled Pixar sequels from the Circle 7 animation days back in like 2004 because, well, there's a lot of demand for it, it's interesting to learn, and there's a lot of fun in making them. But with my YouTube schedule as it is, we've got a lot of slots to upload and even more content to create, and today wasn't always planned to be the wrap up of this trilogy. We were supposed to be reviewing the Monster Hunter movie today, and how you probably shouldn't watch it on Christmas Day for a variety of reasons. The film came out way earlier in the UK, you see, but before I actually got to see it, it was pulled globally, for an unintentionally yet consensually agreed racist line. So I never got to see it. And now it releases later than the US. So we've had to scrap that video entirely, and you'll never get to see the cursed image of this me in a crop top trying to fade a minor Monster Hunter cosplay. And instead, we're replacing Monster Hunter with Monsters Inc. Here we are. If this change wasn't made, by the way, you probably wouldn't have gotten this episode until like February. I'm going on a hiatus in January, but with that exposition out of the way, Disney Circle 7 Animation. If you've seen our previous videos, you would know that this is the company assigned by Disney with the sole purpose of creating Pixar sequels. Disney and Pixar had a business disagreement that made them split ways, and Disney owned the rights to most of their IPs, and so they could just do whatever they wanted. They had their greedy eyes on their own version of Toy Story 3, Finding Nemo 2, Finding Marlin, Finding Remy, however you want to colloquialize it, and as we're here to discuss today, Monsters Inc. 2, Lost in Scaradice. The pun doesn't really work with a British accent, but whatever. Now, these productions were all at varying stages of production. Toy Story had been all plotted out with concept art and the whole script pinned down. Finding Nemo had no concept art, but the entire script was written and is available to read online. Monsters Inc. is somewhere in the middle. It has the least content for us to actually break down, not having any kind of script online for us to digest, and having like six images to go through. So to provide a bit more content for you, we'll be meshing this old sequel idea with a new one. There is a real Monsters Inc. sequel in production. It's not a movie or anything like that, but it's a spin-off TV show releasing on Disney+, Plus. because, you know, they didn't reveal enough of that Disney investor event. One day I'll cover everything here. One day. So anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's get into things. Obviously, there already is a Monsters Inc. 2 in the form of the official Pixar prequel, Monsters University. This isn't that. The reign of Circle 7 was around 2004, and University was 2013. And with that in mind, Garadice is not a prequel. Set just one year after the events of the first film, it's a direct continuation. The society of the monster world has now changed, with the revelation that child laughter is far more of a potent source of energy compared to their screams. But any kind of comedy beats aren't really the priority here. Instead, it's more about the relationship between Sully and Boo. Last time we saw that the two were still connected for a reunion every now and again, and Sully wants another after the special bond he procured in the first film. It's now come around to Boo's birthday, and her door isn't as readily available as before, beyond the treading it already experienced. It's been buried now into the archive, Lives. Still, they dive in to retrieve it, a little treat from Wazowski to Sullivan. Eager for the reunion, Sully's got a gift for Boo, and they enter into her room, only to find that Boo is no longer there. Instead, a sleeping granny takes her place. Boo has moved on somewhere, moving out and away from their reach. And despite the consequences of their upcoming actions, the two then go out on an adventure into the real human world in the hopes of tracking her down. This isn't too bad of a concept. It's interesting because the consensus of the real Toy Story 3 and Finding Dory to a slightly lesser extent is that they're both fairly top tier productions. Monsters University isn't hailed quite so highly. In a lot of ways, it's pretty average, or at least certainly not one of Pixar's best. I personally watched it in cinemas and found most of it to be fairly forgettable, but there was one moment that did really stick out with me, and that has to be the whole sequence that took place within the human world. Seeing Mike and Sully against this dark, realistic world where their entire existence is a high-stakes secret was incredible. The way the two had to traverse around the humans or scare them with intimidation to keep their secrets safe through distance was something that just seemed like the perfect step up for their world. And this film sounds like it could have tackled that element more overtly, if it was completed of course. So on that thought alone, I'm definitely on board and depending on how they would have tackled it, maybe in some strange reality, this would have been the film that could top the official Pixar follow-up. We'll never know, but it's nice to think of. 
Now, since we're in the monster timeline of one year ahead of the first film, let's scoot this time zone to just six months after the first film, because this is the moment that the official Disney Plus spin-off makes its debut with Monsters at Work. The city of Monstropolis is making its transition to a laughter-fueled society, and a new monster has joined the Inc. team, Tyler Tuskman, a recent scare major graduate from Monsters University. He works not as a scarer, even though that's a defunct career anyway, but actually as an engineer in the facilities team. Of course, the main duo still are prevalent in the series, as Tyler dreams of working alongside his idols Mike Wazowski and James P. Sully Sullivan. The series, of course, covers Tyler's adventures through the ranks and systems of the corporation with all sorts of antics on the side, I'm sure. A side story in-universe to explore whatever they wish. It's pretty nice. The idea was supposedly first announced in 2017 by the CEO, and as production progressed, the current team working on this was supplied with all of the concept art for the original film, including all sorts of unused art. These would then be recycled into this new production to flesh it out further. Can't get any more faithful to the original image than that now, can you? And it's expansive too. I love it. Now, speaking of faithfulness, let's return to the less so production again as we continue forward with Monsters Inc. 2, Lost in Scaradice. That still, like, I don't say paradise, anyway. While there's little images left of the actual production, there are more explainable details that are relevant to the story. So, Wazowski and James are exploring out in the real world. We don't know if the adventure's a montage-style gravity sequence of the first film, or the grittier character-based self-exploration of the prequel, but what we do know is that the stakes would be heightened, presumably. Just from knowing the world of Monsters, Inc., breaking the rules and set boundaries by going out into the human world is obviously forbidden and only for those banished. With the two doing as they do, they would surely have the CDA on their tail, as well as any other conflicts arising, like whether this journey is so worth it for Mike, who's probably leaving behind like all of his relationships for this voyage. However it's spun, it's likely this story would require a lot of sacrifice from the both of them, and this tension would cause a rift between the two of them. And even if they want to go back, some way or another, the two are gonna end up stuck in the human world, only stressing things out even more. According to the images we do have, at some point, the two would stop in their tracks and argue. And once at the other side of that uncomfortable conversation, the two would split ways. Clearly having starkly different opinions on where to go from there. As for where each person goes, or what elements of the real world are explored, none of it is documented, or at least available for us right now. Instead, we have a jump away from the actual meat of the story and into the end game story details that wrap the conclusion all together. Because it turns out, all of the adventuring being done by Mike and Sully were all for nothing. A change of perspective for the entire function of Monsters Inc.'s mechanics is through the idea that the teleporting doors that the corporation uses are not attached to particular wardrobes and rooms as one would expect from what's already been established, rather they are intrinsically linked to the people on the other side. When Mike and Sully first breached into Boo's room at the beginning of the film, it wasn't her replacement of someone who's taken over her old house, it was Boo at an age much greater than intended. Some fans have broken down this idea more to assume that the reason the door was being archived in the first place in this film is because of age restrictions. If every door attaches to a person, then eventually they will pass their expiry date, and so shouldn't be used anymore in order to avoid both the leaking of the monster world, as well as losing the efficiency of energy production, as they are no longer innocent children screaming into barrels. We'll talk a little more on all the pieces that come folding out of this revelation in a moment, but first, some more official talk. If you're liking my stuff so far, then do subscribe! We have now finished the Pixar cancelled trilogy, but there are many, 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 many other productions that have been cancelled, so do subscribe to see all the more of that, and if you have some suggestions of your own, feel free to DM me on some social medias, or suggest it on our Discord page. This is supposed to be a very low-budget cosplay of Sully. It's all I had, right? Monsters at Work is a production very far into its lifespan. That's a convoluted way for me to just say that it's nearly to be released. Originally, it was planned for a 2020 release date, but since that was never really gonna happen, we're, and we're at the end of the year now, Monsters at Work is drafted to release on Disney Plus in early 2021 instead. More to that, it's sticking as close to the root to the core franchise as much as possible, with every major voice actor reprising their role. John Goodman, 
and Billy Crystal are back as Sully and Mike. John Ratzenberger, the ultimate Easter egg, returns as the Yeti, as do the characters of Roz, who now supposedly has a twin sister called Rose, and Celia May is back too. On top of that, there's a collection of newbies that join the ranks. Obviously, we've covered Tyler already, but there's also Millie Tuskman, his mum, Val Little, his best friend, Fritz, the scatterbrained boss, Duncan, a plumber who takes advantage of any opportunity he can seize, Cutter, who has no description, and another reappearance from Smitty and Needleman, the two guys who speak more like this. Oh no! You know, is that just me who remembers that? This is the only replacement cast option as Dan Gerson is no longer with us, being replaced by Stephen Stanton instead. Overall, it sounds to be a great reintroduction to the world and characters that we know, with a splash of originality in there too, and plenty of room to explore the world more. I mean, if the Yeti's returning, then presumably, you know, they're gonna go back there. Only other details I have to share on Monsters at Work now is that in February of this year, it was revealed that Stephen J. Anderson was part of the directing team for the series, previously working and directing Meet the Robinsons, a personal soft spot of mine, as well as supervising for all sorts of big name Disney animations. With those last details of the TV series covered, let's finish up the conclusion of Scaradice. It still doesn't quite fit my accent. Anyway, while we've heard the production side of the Disney Plus show, for this one, we know of two names. Rob Muir and Bob Hilgenberg, both of which hired to write the script and storyboard it together, and both of which I struggled to find any notable IMDb page for. But there's one film that crosses over both vague names, Tinkerbell and the Great Fairy Rescue. I haven't seen it, or the others on these lists, but you get the idea. This would have been their big scale debut potentially, and who knows of the potential that they had. Anyway, the reason that Boo is so old is that it's revealed that the human world progressed through time at a much faster rate than the monster one. Surprising that the professionals had never really noticed that in all of their careers beforehand, and I guess that means that the Yeti is dead in this timeline, but it could allow for some sneaky foreshadowing in this film with the two discovering new, more modern technologies or even futuristic stuff as they adventure through the lands. It could also explain how mythical creatures are prevalent in the past of humans since they would appear so rarely between visits that concrete evidence would never really be found of them. And though this does open for a lot of options, it also breaches all sorts of questions. Working out the logic of this seriously complicates the premise a whole bunch more. But let's say this was an early draft of the idea and the nuances were yet to be ironed out. With all of the secrets revealed, it was time for one final reunion. Pixar nowadays are known for making you cry, and for once, Circle 7 animation were kind of ahead of the curve. Much like the cliffhanger of the first film, Sully and Mike return to Boo's room where they see her in her aged state, strapped up to some hospital equipment. A bit extra dark and real to feature the equipment, but all right. Instead of snoring her head off, she's now awakened by the big furry silhouette, and for one final time in her life, she recognizes her furry blue friend with a somber and scratchy kitty. Whether we hear any more of the conversation doesn't really matter. This bittersweet goodbye was set to be the true ending of the Monsters Inc. franchise. Really taking the interstellar approach before interstellar was made, huh? Maybe society was changed again, maybe there was a shift in power again, or a villain overthrown, or maybe it was just a character story and a heartbreaking goodbye. The door would presumably then be archived, never to be opened again. The fans' Pixar theory that the witch from Brave was an old Boo would disintegrate, but maybe a new one would pop up, like how this was all in Boo's head anyway, and her being at the end of her life meant her brain forced imaginary visions of her childhood or something. But at the end of the day, that's not the timeline we're in. Back in 2004, Pixar sequels weren't really a thing, with the exception of that one Toy Story film. But in today's landscape in 2020 plus, we've got franchises brimming everywhere. I mean, Toy Story's also getting that whole new perspective shift film with the announcement of Lightyear. So who knows what future avenues that could brew? As well as obviously all sorts of originals as well. Just all the work ethic in the world is going on for Disney right now. But while for the fake Toy Story, things seemed like a noticeable downgrade in this alternate reality and Finding Nemo was around about the same, this film is debatable. Monsters University didn't blow too many minds, and this idea has a lot of complications to it, so whether you prefer this timeline of the Monsters series or the optional one we've just discussed, at the very least there's more Monsters Inc. on the way with that 2021 Monsters at Work. I for one am very ready to see more Pixar content soon, but for now, we'll have to do a little more waiting in our reality. For now, 
My name's been Daz. You didn't really care. I'll see you for one more video this year, and then it's off to February. I need a break. And I'll see you in a bit. Thank you for making it to the end of this video. I have now been working pretty much every single day for 474 days in a row, with a couple gaps here and there. So yeah, I could do with this break. I had to kind of rush to make this video green screenable, hence the, uh, the dressing gown. But also, uh, I'm going to show an extra footage of this. The actual green screen setup I've got at the moment is a little bit more cluttered than usual. I'm literally in the middle of moving my entire house around for this little holiday break. But anyway, I will see you in a few days and then on February. Thank you for making it all the way to the end. The code word to sneak into a comment, be subtle about it if you can, is white sock. Because that is what 2319 stands for. W-S. White sock. Because it was a white sock on his back. Now you know. All the fun facts in this Taz Reviews end screen. Hmm. <laughs>